after October 1 celebration which turned out to be bloody in the two English speaking regions of the country circulation is still to resume in the southwest region of Cameroon drivers who are on a technical break are calling on the governor of the southwest region Bernardo Calabilai to lift the ban on the circulation of vehicles in the region the economic activities have dwindled to a metrical Derek Jato is on standby. We'll be telling us more in this edition of the News Plus. We'll tell you how teachers are preparing to celebrate their day tomorrow amidst low salary, poor working conditions, and some of them are not even paid at all. The teachers will be honored in this edition of the news. My guest tonight is Barrister Ashu Agbo. With him, we shall be looking at the position of the United Nations as far as the Anglophone crisis is concerned. I will be right back. Good evening. Thanks for joining me. I am Fohan Sinchanji. You're watching the 6 p.m. primetime newscast on Equinox Television, broadcasting live from Douala, Cameroon, Equinox Central News Decks. After the October 1 bloody tension and battle that took place in the two English-speaking regions of the country, with many persons who were shot dead by security forces, our reporter Derek Jato went downtown Boya and met with drivers who say the shutting down or the ban on interurban transportation that's from the southwest region and into the southwest region of uh, Cameroon by the southwest governor Bernard Okalabila is an economic sanction to their activities. Derek Jato has the following story. Boya after October 1. And any person now in the region is paying some penalties. In fact, in the first go place, since the board and the driver for the kind of I don't start the dinner for some kind of it all for my neck. This Wednesday, October 14, 2017, the internet is finally restored. But the people of the region are still frowning. Because we knew that we would cut it. So without you coming back or not, life will still so without any kind of not every Southwesterner was courageous to stay in the region last Sunday. And those who stayed back say their region had a true picture of a war zone. They witnessed the military helicopter on their roofs. The confrontation with the military. Arrests were made. Men were killed. And others are still missing. And for those who fled for safety out of the region, the risk not coming back anytime soon. For October 1 might has come and gone, but some security measures that accompany that day have instead been strengthened. The Southwest Governor Bernard Okalia Bilai has maintained the prohibition of the movement of pricing and the suspension of the interurban transport between different towns and localities. At mile 17 bus station, interurban bus drivers have packed their buses, wind up their glasses, and waiting in confusion and bitterness. All these bus here, they run a dollar road. No one go from Bali. From Bali, they run a side one a dollar road. No one ever go from Bali. They get to produce. All my people here, all my people in Papa. I was going with him. No money to go in our camp. All my people here, we in daylight. So I didn't go to bed for far. They are begging for President Paul Bia to come and solve the Anglophone crisis. For things are already at the extreme. Somebody can't stop. I don't start the dinner for some kind of way. It all for my neck. Derek Jato ending that report. Equinox Television is yet to confirm reports coming from Boya that some four corpses were discovered this day in uh, lower farms. Uh, in lower farms in Boya, we are still to confirm reports that the corpses were discovered uh, early uh, today. And there was tension in uh, Aquaya, tension in Aquaya just about some few minutes ago, where we are told some uh, persons are uh, now seeking refuge at the Presbyterian Church in that locality after some youth are said to have invaded the town 
holding rifles after the October 1. They are mourning the departure of some of their peers. We shall be coming back to that information in our subsequent edition of the news. With the ongoing Anglophone crisis rocking the two English-speaking regions of the country, members of a civil society organization known as Positive Peace Group are discussing adaptable solutions to both local and international levels. More on that, Roland Akon. Conflict has been identified as one of the serious threats to development in Africa, and it is becoming more and more endemic with more and more civil problems in the continent. Members of the civil society organization known as the Positive Peace Group are meeting in Yaoundé to discuss and come up with adaptable solutions to conflicts in the continent. One of our objectives is to uh, stop violence, that is violence prevention. How best can we be able to manage conflicts in such a way that they don't degenerate into violence? The starting point is effective analysis. If you don't understand the conflict, you cannot get a good solution for this conflict. Putting into context their meeting with the current Anglophone crisis in the country, reporters sought to know what the Positive Peace Group has as a proposition to solve the Anglophone crisis in Cameroon. To the current situation in the country, We've all witnessed that the solutions are not actually productive. Conflict can be productive, conflict can be destructive. But we, we must try as much as possible to capitalize on the constructive aspects of conflict. If we don't get persons who can properly manage, uh, analyze these conflicts, we shall not be able to get an adaptable solution that will be able to solve the problem. Because I think most of the solutions that are being applied are wishful solutions, wishful thinking, without any proper analysis of the situation. So we, 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 we badly need um, proper analysis of this uh, situation in the country to have a good solution. The members are building skills and capacities on how to properly analyze conflicts and carry out mediation exercises both at local and international levels. Low pay and poor working conditions, among others, are some of the challenges faced by teachers in both uh, private and confessional schools on the occasion of the celebration marking the Teachers' Day. Our reporter, Innoc Innocent as they went downtown Douala and caught up with some private uh, school teachers as well as those in confessional schools and compiled the following report for the 6 p.m. news. <laughs> Teachers in Lee private and mission schools joined their comrades of government-owned institutions of learning this Thursday to celebrate Teachers' Day in its 2017 edition. Visiting some mission and Lee private educational establishments in Douala, some teachers in these schools wished their teaching and living conditions alleviates unlike those in public or government schools. There's a difference between the public schools since they have the finance they can easily finance their laboratory very equip their laboratory very well as compared to lay private school. You know the economy of the country, our salaries are a little bit below. The students are not well equipped. It makes the teaching task a little bit difficult. A salary anyway for the time being is good. For the previous years it has been somehow so the now is okay, at least I can manage. Other teachers rather consider such challenges and limitations as foundation to nurse or determine a quality teacher to impact knowledge and not necessarily for huge salary. As a, as a teacher, you must try to equip yourself. You should be a reference page either from students or from new teachers. Whatever token is given them in lay privates and mission schools, the teachers say there is need to glorify God and exploit other advantages to sustain their livelihood. But the Bible says everything let's give thanks. So somehow I am okay. If we were in terms of salaries, many people would not be here. You know the teacher has openings. Apart from teaching in the classroom, you could do other small things at least to meet up with life. They remain optimistic their teaching conditions will step up in subsequent years. We keep on striving. When things are good tomorrow, I'm sure it will be good for everybody. A similar expectation with teachers who say they are better paid and equipped in their schools. Uh, the salary, it is it's good. It's good, but I wish it. It were better than what it is. <laughs> you know, because with all what we have as commitments, we will need things, we will need money to, to be there for us to 
to make ends meet. Celebrating with government teachers whose conditions are better off is a way to interact and share ideas that could turn things around. Yeah, it does discuss about the problems that they, 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 they face in field, the problems among them, and to see how to help the teachers help themselves in future. In spite of the limitations faced by private school teachers, one thing is certain, they smile, feel contented with their job, and ready to commune with their comrades on Teacher's Day. Over 12 stores have been consumed by fire at the San Malima Central Market. Even though the cause of the inferno has not been established, uh, several uh, owners of stores have blamed the fire on the intermittent power failure. Moreover, the traders also blame the wrong constructions of poor construction of stores by local authorities. Informed about the incident, the deal for San Malima descended to the site of the incident where it was evaluated at uh, more than 10 million francs CFA properties that were damaged as a result of the incident, whose cause is yet to be determined. And now we talk health. Some 200 patients suffering from different eye complications will benefit free surgery from the team of Africa Mercy Ships here in Douala. Selection for those to benefit began today at the Paku Vita vicinity in Douala 5 locality. We have our reporter, Katrin Kone, with more. The population of Douala and its environs turned out massively Wednesday at Paco Vita to benefit from the free diagnosis for cataract patients. The activity that will run every Wednesday and Thursday at Paco Vita Eye Center is being carried out by the team of African Mercy Ship to help those suffering from complicated eye problems. We're here to serve the people of Cameroon. Uh, we have an uh, opportunity to serve 2,000 people who have blindness from cataracts. At Paco Vita, the patients are welcome in order of arrival. After recording their names, the patients are sent to the visual acuity step, which enables them to know the letters of the alphabet from a distance. The cataract problem, according to the team of Mercy Ship, affects both adults and youth. Cataracts, you, you can't prevent cataracts because they occur as you get older. Uh, so most people who get 50, 60 years old will start developing cataracts. Cataracts also affect newborns, so genetic or congenital cataracts is a very serious problem because it affects children from a very young age for their whole life. We're also treating children's cataracts, not just adult cataracts. Meantime, during the consultation proper, the disease is confirmed and the patient is declared eligible. That is when they are referred to Lacantini Hospital for surgery. Uh, the 1st of March uh, to find the patients that have cataracts so that we can serve them on board the ship with operations. The operations remove the cataracts and restore the vision uh, so that they don't have to even wear glasses afterwards uh, and have very good vision then for the rest of their life. In contextualizing the activity of free treatment of patients in Cameroon, the team of African Mercy is aimed at fighting blindness to many Cameroonians. The message has gone through Katrin Kone every Wednesdays and Thursdays at the Paku Vista vicinity in Dwala 5 uh, locality municipality that is uh, here in uh, Wuri Division. Now, after Mercy Ships, the government brings another health international non-governmental organization to Cameroon, the one-month mission of Flying High Hospital, the NGO, which is specialized in eye problems and will be based in Yaoundé to treat 235 patients, was presented to the press today by the Health Minister, Andre Mamafuda. ...of the Africa, High, uh, Africa Flying Hospital with Andre Mamafuda. He is the Minister for Public Health. The Orbis mission is not a mass care campaign, but rather the mentoring of the personnel by their mentors. Every learner has already identified difficult cases in their area and discussed them online with their mentor. Thus, the 235 patients 
concerned by the mission or already known as this mission has been prepared for months now. Let me therefore emphasize on the fact that you should tell this to the population no admission of person is planned during the orbit mission. Thus, the population should not move to the Simalen International Airport, to Obak, or to the Yaoundé Central Hospital. Catalan has been in chaos far even more than what, what we was witnessed in the two English-speaking regions of the country, just that most Catalans, or most of them who uh, got themselves in the strike action were not killed, as please use uh, rubber bullet. It should be noted that there was a massive crackdown on some of the protesters as they equally demanded for their independence from Spain. Euronews has the details. Tens of thousands have taken part in a general strike in Barcelona, joining in marches and blocking roads in protest at Sunday's violent crackdown by Spanish police. It had been called before the region's referendum and had been intended to support calls for independence, but the violence meted out by police has now galvanized some and worried others. I've always considered myself Catalan, but I wasn't pro-independence. But with recent events, we're outraged. We can't be part of a country where the government and political parties don't condemn police repression. Nearly 900 people were hurt when security forces tried to prevent Sunday's ballot by storming polling stations. I'm not pro-independence, I'm Catalan, and I'm devastated because this issue has completely polarized the Spanish and Catalan governments. There's so much uncertainty. The correspondent says the police action on Sunday has escalated the social and institutional struggle to a level never before seen in democratic Spain. We've come to the end of the first segment of this news. Join me and my guest now for the second part coming up. My guest tonight is Senior Barrister Ashu Agbo. He is a member of the Cameroon Bar Association with him. We shall be looking at the stance of the United Nations on the ongoing crisis rocking the two English-speaking regions of Cameroon. Senior Barrister Ashu Agbo, good evening. Good evening to the viewers. Good evening, for It's a pleasure welcoming you. Thank you. On set tonight, now you are from Manu Division. How was it on the 1st of October? Hi, here from Ewele in the Manu Division. 1st of October, uh, people, from what I hear, because the roads have been blocked, internet was shut down, and uh, all we could get was information from, uh, by telephone. So I was informed that um, it was and is still very rough in Murphy, especially in my village and the Ejagam area. It's very rough. Uh, my grandfather's house was attacked by the forces of order. I'm surprised because that house is not inhabited since we, the occupants, are, we are down this way. We only use it when we go to the village. So they, they broke into the off-license that is there, drank all the drinks, broke the bottles, shattered the doors, entered, removed things, and burnt. And uh, in fact, so did that. Now you don't know who, who did that. We know it was done by soldiers. We're told it was done by soldiers. And I promised legal action once things will be, will be, will be calmed down. Well, once uh, things will be calmed out, carry out some legal action against uh, those who sent people, soldiers to go attack houses. Okay, that's, that was the situation in Ebele? Ewele. Ewele. Yes. That's uh, it's a village in Manu Division. Just next to Kimbung, which is the largest native uh, village in the whole of uh, West, uh, former West Cameroon. Mm -hmm. Now, we just had information before coming uh, in that in Akwaya, it was a tense atmosphere in Akwaya today, uh, and that many persons had to seek refuge in some uh, church premises at the Presbyterian Church in uh, Akwaya. We have uh, the information very reliable from a reliable source there. Now, uh, uh, Barista, all these are happening within the context of the crisis rocking the two English-speaking regions of the country. The United Nations, for the a second time, uh, the spokesperson of the United Nations Secretary General said the 
Cameroon government should investigate uh, what happened on the 1st of October. Many persons are saying that uh, the government, which is like a party and a judge, cannot be today be asked to investigate that. You are saying that mind. Uh, how can that be done? I want, I want to say that the government should be very careful because the United Nations is not a fool to ask them to investigate. I was reliably informed that there were 21 UN observers who were sent to cover that region on the 1st of October. So if the government has been asked to investigate, they should not play the fool and try to give wrong, uh, either wrong figures or wrong, wrong facts because the UN had its observers on the field. So I think it's a trap that the UN is giving, is setting to the government. And this government has to be very careful in the way it's handling that matter because the UN had its own independent observers who were there and who would tell the story. Now, the, the, the United Nations has called for a refrain that's calling on the uh, political leaders to ask their various parties to refrain from acts of violence. Can you also today condemn acts of violence uh, as far as what took place on the 1st of October? Uh, in so far as what I have been informed and what I saw, the images I saw, people were, the population was marching peacefully with uh, leaves in their hands. I saw no, no person with a stick, no person with a rubber gun, no person with kerosene or anything to, catch, to cause fire. So the, the violence that existed was caused by the forces of order who went there. No, I've not seen a single civilian who caused any act of violence. Even in Bameda, we saw how it was a force of order who set bikes on fire. When the bike riders escaped and left their bikes, they are the ones who set them on fire. So, in fact, I think this government should tell the police people who, and the soldiers who have been sent there to come back to their senses. There is no need for all this. There is no need for all this. You shut down internet, you close the borders. We don't have access. I want to go to my village to go and see what is happening. I cannot go. The roads are closed. In the first feed that you, that you presented, drivers were complaining. You cannot cross the Mongo Bridge. There's no way. It's shut down. They said people were trying to come in from, from, the, from the Nigeria. It's not possible. All the roads have been closed. In Mafia itself, after the general hospital, there is a big barrier. Nobody goes to the Ejagam region. Why? So they ask the police, ask them why they are doing that. Nobody leaves Mafia to go to Bisongabang. It has been closed. Nobody, not even the bike ride, not, not even a pedestrian. So I think that the violence, we know who is carrying out the violence. There is no pretending because if we have to carry out the dialogue that the United Nations is prescribing, we have to be true to our, ourselves and true to our conscience because we have an uphill task in conducting any possible dialogue. The expert on uh, conflict resolution whom you, you just heard was very right in saying that in a conflict situation, you must first of all start by diagnosing what is wrong. And in the present context that we have, that diagnosis has to be posed because when it shall come to the time for this country to sit on the table, we shall have a very serious problem as to who will represent the Anglophone population. Because that population is angry, very angry with the government for brutalizing its lawyers and teachers for locking up its uh, 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 representatives who were sent to negotiate mm -hmm. for shutting that internet for going to for coming now on the first of October to beat people and burn houses okay. so i think that they will have to start first of all by pacifying that population that no longer have has any confidence in the former members of the that, consortium. that's quickly before we go we have information that we are running out of time yes so i am saying that mm -hmm. uh, the, the population no longer has uh, any confidence in the former members of the consortium and they only believe in their diaspora so the government will have an uphill task getting the people with whom they are going to negotiate. All right. It was a pleasure having you, Senior Barrister Ashu Agbo. You've contributed your own as far as uh, this is concerned. It was equally a pleasure being with you in today's edition of the news, the 6 p.m. primetime newscast on Equinox Television. Good night.